Welcome into Press Box Live. I'm Stan the Fan Charles of Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com, along with Luke Jackson, our managing editor at Press Box and PressBoxOnline.com. And of course, the old two percenter who today was 0.3. I was 3% today, 0 3. <laughs> zero three, and I I did something. I said, "Hey, watch! I'm going to send this to Ross next to you." Which I used the Cleveland Indian Oriole line or or, or cusp. Right, and right next was the Dodger Oriole, and I said, "Watch this!" And I put Don Stanhouse, <laughs> and it came up zero point four percent. And then I sent it to you. All I will, I'll hear. I will hear the end of that. All right. All right. <laughs> um. But welcome, Ross Grimsley. Uh, we are here to talk a little bit about the Orioles and Major League Baseball. We generally convene every Monday, and we're brought to you by the Costas Inn, by the new Atmans at Harbor Point, corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different, a bar. Like, for example, tonight at Atmans, the new one at Harbor Point, you have uh, a bar you could watch an Orioles game at tonight and uh, dodge the raindrops uh, as the Orioles will take on the Kansas City Royals. And we're also brought to you by the Casas Inn, by uh, uh, them, and also by the folks at A.J. Michaels. And they have a question. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates? That would be A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Orioles have a pretty successful opening weekend. Um, Luke, your thoughts. Uh, were you at the ball game on uh, Thursday, the opener? I was not. I was not at any of the games uh, this weekend. But to your point, uh, largely a successful weekend, I would say, for the Birds. Uh, I guess fans would have preferred them to – even out the runs a little bit. So it wasn't like 11, 13, and one, <laughs> maybe more like eight, eight, and eight. Maybe that would have been more effective, but that's Probably why you would have won all three that way. Yeah. yeah that's why you play 162, Ross, right? That, that's well, you, usually when you score a lot of runs, the next day you're going to score just a few, <laughs> any. So you see, we see that more often than not. So yeah. But overall, hey, positive weekend, a lot of good things. Luke, you had a much better view than I did from the press box, and I'm not complaining about my view because we also can look at cameras. You know, we can watch on the TV monitors, but you especially were really impressed with Corbin Burns' opening day. Oh, he was awesome. Uh, and that was a clinic, and Ross can speak to this a heck of a lot better than me, of breaking ball execution in terms – he hung a slider to Trout in the uh, bottom – excuse me, the top of the first inning, and that was it. And he was spotting his breaking balls, both the slider and curveball, exactly the way you want to, throwing that hard cutter by hitters. He had 11 strikeouts in six innings. That was a master class. That was a veteran pitcher who has had a lot of opening day assignments in the past. Just do his thing. He was uh, as get, advertised. As <laughs> advertised. That <laughs> is a horse. And yeah. that's what the Orioles were looking for when they traded for him. And that's what they got on opening day. And I can't wait to watch him on uh, Wednesday. Weather pending. Your thoughts on Grayson on day two? Uh, looked very similar to what we saw in the second half of last year, where he was attacking with the fastball uh, at the top of the zone with that and was pairing that with slider, curveball, and a devastating changeup. A he devastating changeup that I I think he must have watched uh, Aaron Hicks bat last year when playing for the Orioles because he fooled him not once, not twice. I think three at bats he struck right. out on changeups. Right, and and yeah, he he saved his best changeups of the day for Aaron Hicks, and Aaron Hicks probably standing in the uh, uh, batter's box wondering why me. But yeah, he, his changeup was awesome. Uh, he had nine strikeouts in six innings. That's exactly the way you want to start. And I thought. For the last four innings yesterday, Tyler Wells was really good too. I he thought just, he pitched uh, very well. He, I, I, he got a couple he, rough innings. He yeah. got ambushed a little bit in the first and second innings by the Angels, who were pretty aggressive with him. It's not like he gave up four runs, one of which was a uh, an errant back pick by uh, James McCann. Uh, but it wasn't like they they were running up his pitch count. They were getting on him early in counts and. I think the uh, home run to Taylor Ward over the big uh, wall and left, that was just a poorly located fastball in Taylor Ward's wheelhouse 
uh, Ben McDonald mentioned it on the uh, broadcast that uh, Tyler Wells wants to pitch up with his fastball to Taylor Ward. He missed with that. And then the next inning, they were just tic-tac, uh, tic-tacking him uh, early in the count. So, uh, and he figured it out. It's just they didn't score any runs. And sometimes that's going to happen. He, he left a couple balls up in the zone, which were, which are, you know, lambasted. But you know what? The Orioles starters went six innings apiece. Yeah. They struck out 27 guys and walk one. Right. Now that right there is going to, they continue that or anything near that. They're going to save the bullpen and they score some runs. They're going to, they're going to win a lot of games. So that, I, I thought that was very impressive. I didn't see any of the games. I saw the highlights of uh, a lot of them. And uh, I mean, obviously Burns was outstanding. Uh, Rodriguez was uh, what, you know, what you expect. Wells did a good job. He did. He did leave some balls up in the zone uh, that that were hit. But uh, overall, I thought everything went well, and he didn't get any runs. You know, unfortunately. But uh, hey, they're, they're off. They're off and running. And I'll tell you what. I thought it was also really good to get Keegan Aiken and Dylan Tate back on the mound after they went through some uh, injury plague seasons last year. Uh, Dylan Tate got on the mound twice. I thought that was good for him. And uh, Keegan Aiken got on the mound on Thursday. So I thought it was good to see both of those guys back on the horse. Yeah, I was hoping to see K- Kimbrell, but I, I can kind of understand uh, not pitching him because you don't want to pitch him back-to-back. If one of those the next couple games would have been close in the ninth inning, you would have had to pitch him back-to-back days. And they don't want to do that, right. especially now. So – I would so assume I would assume he'd pitch tonight no yeah. matter what the score is because the weather forecast is not favorable for them playing tomorrow yeah. or Wednesday. Yeah, and I Kansas agree. City has an uh, uh their home opener on Thursday. The Orioles are off Thursday, but so they won't be able to play any rained out games. So, yeah, and it, Ross, you could speak to this a lot better than we could. So early in the season, so I was watching a Mets broadcast, and I think it was Severino that was really struggling uh, in the Saturday game for the Mets. And the SNY booth was talking about, well, he might have to wear this because he's got to build up his pitch count early in the year. Like he's got to be able to get through like five to get to a point where he can go six, seven innings his next time out. He's got to be, and you also don't want to burn your bullpen up this early in the season. So they were saying that, you know, he's kind of in a situation where he's just got to get to the fifth inning to get himself built up because it's not like these guys throw very much in spring training anymore. Uh, even less now than in the past in the, you know, old, olden days, basically you would leave spring training. You have thrown maybe 90 pitches and pitched uh, six or seven innings, depending on your pitch count. They don't do that now. Right. So what you're and, and we were even doing it back then was pitching and still getting arm strength at the beginning of the season and building building it up. Now they're doing it a little bit more, but they they pitch less innings. But I thought it was really positive to see guys uh, go six innings for for the, you know the O's. Yeah. That, that was that was impressive that they were able to do it. And they they one thing they've done in the you know over the last couple of years is they've cut their pitch counts down right and they get six or seven innings and uh you know with with under 100 pitches and you can do that you're going to really uh you know get a lot of innings uh and save your bullpen so what, I, that was, what about from the relief side ross where we were talking about kimbrel where it's game four now and stan and i were thinking that they probably got to get him in a game today no matter what at what point does a reliever have to get on a mound once the season starts? It, it you know it it depends. Everybody's different, so they got to see. Kimbrel's an older guy, and pitching back to back days for him, and that's something I think they're going to try to keep away from until he builds up his arm strength. Uh, when it warms up, things will be a little bit d- different for guys. But uh, I mean, you want to get him out there, but he's a guy that would. Uh, I mean, they had two games; they were they blew people out. So there really wasn't a need for him. Now that there's going to be plenty of uh, low scoring games that they're going to, you know, want to get him in, especially the the eighth and ninth inning for saves. But, so but my pro- my process though is thinking Ross that you got a day off on Thursday and you may get back to back rainouts the next two nights. You wouldn't right. want Kimbrel not to pitch for like eight days. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they may get him in. Depending oh, on he'll be in tonight. Yes, they might get him in as early as they can, yeah. depending on the situation of the game. So yeah. he will get. And then you got Cano and the other guys. I mean, you, you got a group in the bullpen there that can a, a guy gets hot, 
you know, Cano, especially a guy that can that can close. And so yeah, you can kind of a little bit of a leeway there that you can do some different things. So I uh, they're gonna be careful, especially now, but they score runs. This is gonna be a you know, the, the bullpen's gonna love it, the starters are gonna love it. It's gonna Luke, be a fun time. Luke, before we talk offense, I thought Webb uh, actually uh who I didn't think was gonna make the team. I thought he looked much more like the Webb when we first acquired him yesterday. Uh, you know, I thought he was impressive. He had some hop on the ball. Yeah, well, as we were talking about, I think last week uh, with regard to Webb, when he came on board with the Orioles last year, that's when Michael Bauman was sent down to Norfolk because he was gassed. And so yeah. he took over the Michael Bauman role of being used a lot. And I think at one point, Brandon used him three straight days. I think they overused Webb in the final six weeks of the season. And I thought that showed up in the final two weeks of the season and in the playoffs. So they've got to be a little more careful with him. You want to, you, you want to stay away from the danger of thinking that so-and-so has a rubber arm. Nobody does, uh, especially in today's game when everyone's pretty much max effort. So, yeah, I just think they've got to use him a little more carefully. Offensively, I thought that uh, I, I just am so impressed, uh, Ross, where uh, Gunnar Henderson is right now. I mean, I, I very rarely jump jump the gun and say this guy's going to be a great player. Uh, he's going to pass good and very good. He looks like he's going to be a great player. He's picking up right where he left off, basically, yeah. and uh, you know, swinging the bat. You kind of knew that, but his defense. I mean, he makes the play he made the other day. Uh, with Sensation. Or, that, that was, I mean, that, that that fantastic. He's got some arms for a lot of guys would throw that ball one hop to first base, yep. but he threw it in the air, bounced up. He, he's an athlete, you know. He's a, he's an athlete. He can do a lot of good things, and you know, he's uh he's going to have a super year if he stays healthy. Luke, um, in addition, I think two other hitters, Santander and uh, Mountcastle, have looked pretty darn good this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Santander, Santander, I should say, contract year. So this is a big season for him. And if he has another season like he had in 22 and 23, he's going to set himself up for a lucrative three or four year deal, I would imagine. He's a guy who could play a passable corner outfield and he can hit for contact and power from both sides of the plate and has hit in the middle of the order for a really good team uh, the past two or three seasons. So yeah, I, I think this is a big year for him, and, and it's also a big year for Mountcastle with someone at AAA who has very similar skill set to him who's coming quick, right? So uh, everyone, uh, there's no shortage of motivation on this team for sure. Yeah, Competition breeds a lot of good stuff. Yeah. I'm just curious. I did the, the Glenn Clark show on Friday, and Glenn was addressing the Mateo playing second – Mm -hmm. And Westberg DHing mm -hmm. like as it as if it was like making a statement that they don't want Westberg playing second because he's the eventual third baseman. And I said, I said that doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> and yet yesterday they did just that again, except Westberg played third and Mateo was at second. Um, you see anything going on there? Well, no, because Westberg's playing second tonight, so. Okay. No, I, I just think they I think they think that Westberg is a talented infielder at three different spots. I really love him at second because right. I think his one, second base is a brilliant second base. I, I think his arm might be a touch soft for the left side of the infield, but he's a great athlete for a right. big guy and he's got a terrific first step. And the toughest play for a second baseman, you Stan, you and I have talked about this is going from your left to your right up the middle because for a second baseman it almost feels like you're moving uphill mm -hmm. and you've and you've got to have great quickness and a great first step in order to get to that ball and you've got to have the arm strength to plant and fire uh from behind second base he can do that yeah and i thought there was a noticeable difference last year when westberg was at second compared to when frazier was at second and nothing right. against frazier you know right. he's he's limited, seven years though. older I mean, yeah, so, really. <laughs> yeah, it, so, yeah, I, I really like Westbrook at second, and we'll see him there tonight. Yeah, okay. And I think you you were right on pointing out that he's going to get uh, – Mateo is going to get into action 
a lot of times against left-handed pitching, right. and we face several left-handers uh, this week. Right. I and, mean, I, I like what Mateo brings to the table, but he kind of hits like a pitcher against right-handed pitching. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just being honest. That it's like Ross Grimsley used to. Exactly. Yeah, hey, I got a hit. Come on. <laughs> but he, yeah, but and so, but against lefties, he's fine, and he and you can much more easily fit him in in those lineups. So the, the best thing you can say about Ross is that hitter Luke is he was no Hank and Gary. Mm. No, hey, I hit two twelve one year. Mm. Did you? Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> hey, um. I wanted to touch base on, first of all, there's a, there's a lot of people are kind of making fun of, Oh God, Ron Washington. He really, uh, he really uh, in over his head managing this team. He had to call a managerial meeting. I think he plans to try and stay on top of this team. There is some talent there. They're not a good team. They can't finish higher than fourth place in that division, but they can, they can play better baseball than they did on games one and two. Ross, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, you don't want the guy in this day and age. Guys can get down really easy. They're, you know, their 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 egos and attitudes are really a, a little bit different than years ago, and they can get down on themselves in a hurry. And he's just trying to let them know it, it's the first two games of the season. I mean, this stuff can change in a heart. The Pirates are four and zero. They started off. They started off uh, really well last year and folded as the season went on. And uh, there's a reason for that. I, I'm not going to get into it now, but I would love to. But anyway, that, uh, that, that that's what happened. So he's just kind of nipping this in the bud a little bit. So just keep your heads up, keep driving, keep doing the, the things you're supposed to do and make the routine plays and what have you. And, you know, if it's meant to be, we'll we'll end up better than than uh, winning more than we lose. And they Ross, certainly played a much cleaner game on Sunday. Yeah, they did. No question yeah. about it. Ross, um, a lot of athletes put their foot in their mouth with some things they say. Oh, yeah. uh, you've you've watched uh, Rendon play. Um, yes, you know, and he said some things. He's missed what most of the last three seasons. I think he's played about eighty games in three seasons. Ever since he's been with the Angels, basically. And, and then he gives this interview where he says, "Hey, uh, it's it's nice. Baseball is my my kind of like he didn't say hobby, but he said my family and religion are the important things in my life. This is just work to me." Um, do you that's, think that's the guy you a, want on your team? Do you think of him as an apathetic? player or is he it, you just know, a it, diminished or is he just a diminished player who happened to say something stupid that feeds into the fact that fans are pissed that he hasn't made, played more he's made a lot of comments and uh things in interviews that will kind of rub you the wrong way and turn you off but to make that why would you say that well why, <laughs> why do you want to aggravate the people and i mean this game was fun i mean it's going to give your family and you so much when you're yeah. out of the game. Yeah. Why would you want to say these things? I just right. don't get it. Why, you know, it, it's a, it's a job. Well, when it becomes a job, then you move on to something else. Right. Because right. this is a game. It's fun. And so, you get paid mega bucks. So the reason this, I this is the closest you're, you're ever going to get to the lottery. The reason I asked the question, do you see him eventually butting heads with Ron Washington over a sort well, of laissez-faire attitude. If, on the if, if that's the attitude he has and it, that he brings to the table, it affects other people. Yeah. It affects other people on the team. One guy can screw up the whole thing for everybody, you know, and you just, if that's going to be, if he's going to say that kind of stuff, you know, and not go out and produce. Right. Or he gets hurt as he usually does. That's going to be an issue. And I, I think, uh, you know, and, I look at, at at Ron as an old school guy who has obviously changed to the new school way of way of doing things. But uh, I know Bochi, I know him, I know Dusty Baker. Those guys had some old school things that they still yeah. did and went to. And some of that is not going to change. And when you say and do some of the things that some of these guys do, they're not going to be happy with it. Now they may, they'll address it maybe a different way but they're not going to be happy and they're not going to tolerate it. Luke, a prediction on Trout. Does he end his career as an angel or do you think this year 
even with Ron Washington pulling in the right direction, trying to use his everything he can as mm -hmm. a jockey to get them to play better. Do you think he just says kind of at the end of this year, Hey guys would be a good idea if you tried to find me another place to play. Cause he's now, he's going to have one of the, almost like an Ernie Banks career Ross, right. where he played his whole career and never yeah. won anything. Right. You so got I, was, yeah. I, I was talking to a couple buddies about this, about what it would take to trade him. It, it would be complicated because he's got a lot of money left on his contract. I think it's a lot of money and, and years. diminishing skills and ability to go to the post maybe. Right. So I believe including this year, he has seven and two forty five left. Wow. Would he Ooh. get seven and two forty five on the open market right now? No, I think he would probably get like five and one fifty, one sixty, something like that, because he's still Mike Trout, and yes, he's on the other side of the mountain at this point, and he's struggled to go to the post, as you said. But when he's in there, this is still an easy All Star caliber outfielder who can to, play to get anything meaningful back in a return they would have, have to eat, eat some money 80, you, and 80, that's what i mean that you 80, would have to eat a good million bit of money dollars. here's the complication for me so he's got he's got a no trade clause right even if he didn't he would because he would have the 510 rights so mike trout can say not only i would like you to trade me he could say i want you to trade me to the phillies and we've seen this in other sports where uh, we saw it with Bradley Beal and the Wizards and the Suns. He said, not only did he tell Ted Leonsis, I want you to trade me, I want you to trade me to Phoenix. And so the Wizards had no leverage. They had to move him to Phoenix, and they didn't really get a whole lot in return. Right. So, and the same thing could happen with the Angels if Trout goes chooses to go that route. Now, I think what would be more likely is that Trout would say, here are four or five teams I would like you to explore a trade with. I think that's more likely that he would do that because I don't think he wants to leave the angels in a lurch either. Right. So I, to me, it's a complicated deal. And I do think Trout. And keep in mind, Luke, not to interrupt you, but the Dodgers won't factor in because the Dodgers, whether they'd warn him or not, the, <laughs> Artie Moreno isn't trading them to the Dodgers. Right. Correct. So would he want to come back East? I don't know. And so, yeah, for me, it's a little bit of a complicated deal. I don't think it happens this year. That might be more of an off-season deal because, it, again, the Angels have to go to Trout and say, here's our plan, here's our vision, here's what we want yeah. to do. We want to do, like, a full rebuild. Trout, at that point, might say, "Yeah, let's explore let's, some other avenues. He yeah. wants to win. He wants to go somewhere and win. Yeah. That, let me I tell mean, you a little bit. Bottom let me line. Tell you let me tell you a little bit about two of our sponsors. Uh, if you are craving that classic New York deli experience, look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point, right adjacent to Fells Point. Then uh, the corned beef is piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different, a bar. Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open, forget a load of this, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at our bar for the next O's game. That's tonight at Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. And then a place that's vastly different, uh, that's the Costas Inn. Uh, they've been sponsors of mine since back in the mid-90s. So they've been close to 30 years on with Stan the Fan and Press Box. Not that I was started press box 30 years ago, but they used to be with me. They've stayed with me uh, with press box. Uh, and they're just a tremendous restaurant, whether you want lunch or dinner, take out or in, eat in. Uh, the Costas Inn is a wonderful place to go. Their most notoriety, of course, is that they are a destination point for steamed crabs. But they've got incredible crab cakes to eat in or take out. They've got great crab soup. They got dinner specials Monday through Friday uh, that will uh, really knock your socks out in taste and mm. how easy it is on the uh, wallet. That's the Costas Inn, 410-477-1975. If you want to order your crabs in advance, which is a must, check it out. Talk to mm. them. Get the availability, price point, and, um, and the size you want. Uh, that's at the Costas Inn costasin.com.
All right, now back for our remaining time. Ross, glad to have you on the show today because we're talking uh, about rehabilitation of a couple pitchers that I think going in, we thought they'd be key to the Orioles' success this year. Um, I still think Kyle Bradish really is a big key. I think the longer John Means is suspect, I think he remains just that suspect uh, who hasn't really pitched other than that really brilliant game, Luke, that he pitched in Cleveland last year, uh, where he pitched six or seven, I think, one-run innings, um, that he's really become sort of a suspect. Uh, Ross, your thoughts on what you're hearing about both of them starting to round into into pitching a little bit. More. Yeah, and I think uh, Bradish, what, he threw 35 pitches on the side. Yep. And I guess he threw all his pitches and, and seemed Said to he felt a, really good. Yeah, seemed to find you know, The thing is, is don't try to do too much too soon because you feel – because you're feeling good, that'll just set you back. A means, on the other hand, he had his first game in uh, uh, in Triple A, I believe, and pitched an inning, six hits, seven runs, one base on ball, two strikeouts, and he gave up two home runs. First time out, uh, and here's a guy, you know, he's not an overpowering pitcher. And I think that that's the reason he ended up hurting his elbow because he tried to be something he wasn't by throwing harder than he was capable of. And it ended up hurting him and uh, set him back considerably. But here's a guy that was his first outing. Uh, wouldn't read a whole lot into it. I mean, he's just getting to feel again and and being a control type guy. You're going to have th things like that in spring training that happen, especially your first time out, getting the feel he hadn't been out in a while. So uh, after maybe his third or fourth outing, then uh, he has numbers considerable. Uh, uh, like this, I would, uh, there'd be some concern, but again, how does he feel? How many pitches is he throwing? How is his pitches? You know, how's the breaking ball, how's the change up, the arm speed, uh, movement on the ball. That, there's a lot of different things, but I would think after his third or fourth start, you'll have an idea of what uh, what he's doing. Stick where I'll stick with me for a minute on Bradish. What do you think is next for him? The next couple steps, does he throw 50 pitches? And then do they start maybe throwing him some BP, a couple BPs to see yeah. him actual face? Absolutely, yeah. You know. He's, he's, he's going to face hitters. Yep. You no, know, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, he can he can do it maybe a, depending on how far along he is. Uh, you know, face hitters a few times in BP, uh, simulate a game where there's no pressure. I mean, you can do it with a screen up, depending, but a lot of times guys don't have it, but. You just it's a slow, a slow paced thing, depending on how he feels, how he bounces back, how he bounces back after facing hitters, because you're gonna put a little bit more effort into the pitches when hitters step in and when there's a game. Simulate no matter if it's a simulated game or a regular game, uh he's gonna, you know, you'll you'll put more effort into it. And then you'll get a chance to see how he bounces back, how he feels uh, you know, in between uh the projected starts. So that, that there's a lot goes into it, but like I said, 35 pitches. He may face hitters and throw 35 pitches, then progress to 50 pitches. I mean, that, that's a progression thing, but it all depends on how how he feels. Luke, I almost feel that at this point, Bradish's recovery could almost be termed more predictable in some ways than Means, even though Means' injury is not supposed to be that severe. It was supposed to be that he was behind everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Where do you see the potential that Bradish pitches to major league hitters in a game again? Mid-June, late June? Oh, I think Ross would have a much better idea of that than me. We just don't know what the extent of his UCL damage was. And we don't know if he's now pitching from a mound because the PRP injection worked. Is that what that means? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea. I mean, if he's if he's throwing basically all of his pitches in a 35 pitch bullpen and feels good afterward and feels good when he wakes up the next day, that's a good sign. But we were also hearing similar things when Felix Batista was throwing lives before the playoffs last year. Yeah. So you just don't know. And sometimes it's a situation where you get to a point and you're just not quite over the hump and you have to go through the, you really want to avoid the knife if at all possible, because it's such a long and arduous recovery. And there are a lot of, 
hoops that you have to jump through in that recovery, as we've seen with John Means, as we've seen with Felix Batista, you had to have a follow-up procedure. So uh, you really want to do everything you can uh, to avoid the knife. But, I mean, is there a drop-dead date in mind where if, you know, by mid-May they've they've got to have a decision made that we're going to pitch through this or we're going to get the surgery? I don't know. I, I But I do think if you're going to pitch through it, you have to be pretty confident he can pitch through it for the rest of his career. Yeah. You, know, you can't, yeah. you don't want to delay the inevitable. Right. So you just I, can't tell. I mean, it all is, depends I, on, it all depends on how he feels uh, the next day and yep. especially the day after mm-hmm. but yep. when you're going to be the sorest, you know, after that's a great throws. point. Cause he says he feels good after he's throwing it's yeah. the next day. <laughs> it's the next day. It's tomorrow. How are you going to feel tomorrow? And that, that's hey, hey, real quick before we sign off, I thought we'd play pre-game show a little bit. Orioles sure. Michael Waka for Kansas City mm-hmm. makes his uh, Kansas City Royals debut against Dean Kramer, slotted in right now as the number four starter for the Orioles. Game time, remember, folks, is now six thirty-five on the week games, Monday through Friday, all season long. Not going to change uh, when school's out of session back up to seven o'clock all the Monday through Friday night games are going to be at 635 the lineup tonight for Kansas City Mikel Garcia at third Bobby Witt at short Vinny Pasquantini at first Salvador Perez is catching Melendez is in left field Hunter Renfro in right field Adam Frazier playing at Camden Yards is an opponent now playing second base batting seventh um Batting eighth is Nelson Velasquez, DH, and Kyle Isbell will bat ninth as a center fielder. The Orioles will use this lineup tonight. Gunnar Henderson leads off at short. Adley Rutschman is catching. Anthony Santander is in third in right field, excuse me. Ryan Mountcastle is at first base. Ryan O'Hearn, DHing. Austin Hayes in left field. Mullins in center field. Jordan Westberg. In at second base, batting eighth and batting ninth, back at third base, Ramon Urias. Game time, weather permitting, and I think they're going to get this one in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the next two nights are really in question. Uh, game time is six thirty-five at Camden Yards. Should be a good game. You got, you got two. Guys. You know, I didn't realize Waka was twenty-five and six over the last two years. Yeah. Oh, he's been really good. He's been really fourteen good. and four last year, three twenty-two, and Kramer thirteen and five. I mean, yep. he's uh, 32 starts, 172 innings. Uh, and I'll tell be. you, Ross, he, he looked like he had a little more zip on the ball in spring training than I've seen him before. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's, he's a guy that has to pitch and lo- locate. Yep. You know, he don't, he don't have a tremendous amount of movement, but he, he throws strikes. Yeah, well, he well, he struck out 157 guys and only walked 55 and 172 innings. And one thing I think to look for tonight is that Waka has one of the best change-ups in baseball. Mm-hmm. But it's going to be a cold night. Doesn't yeah. have the same feel for that pitch. Yeah, that's very, very true. Very you know, true. it's interesting though with Kramer now slotted as number four starter instead of number three. He's going to cut Wagga. Maybe <clears throat> one of the best number fours he comes up against. He may be a, a mismatch in a lot of games. It wouldn't surprise me if he wins fourteen or fifteen games with this team. Uh, this Who's year, that? Wagga. No, Dean Kramer. Kramer. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. he uh, he throws strikes. He makes the pitches when he needs to. Uh, he does give up some home runs. He gave up twenty seven home runs last year. Yep. And that, that right. that's well, an issue, through. you know. And Waka only give up fifteen, but he threw about uh, forty less innings. We own a we own agreement. If somebody hits a home run for the Orioles, his name might be Henderson. <laughs> oh, oh all right. <laughs> Who do you, you think? Know what? Will hit one I'm going to say I'm going to have a pick to click for you. Austin okay. Hayes. Austin, Austin Hayes. Austin, yeah. well, he's due. Yeah. All right. All right, Luke. Uh, Ross, what about you? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Mountcastle. He's uh, he hadn't hit a home run yet. It's only That's three games, but uh, I'm, I'm going to go with I'm Mountcastle. Stick with Gunnar Henderson tonight. We'll see, see, Ross and I know that Waka has those reverse splits because of the changeup. <laughs> Yeah, okay. so we're going with right-handed hitters. All right, good for you. I'll All stick right. with Gunnar Henderson against That's a lot of people. Great pick. All right. <laughs> Hey, uh, it's been real. We'll talk next Monday. All right. Birds gotcha. will be the birds will be in Pits, Pittsburgh over the weekend. By the way, if any Oriole fans want a really accessible ride, it's about four hours to Pittsburgh. And PNC B- Ballpark is a tr- you and your dad should go this week, Luke. Mm. It's a great, great ballpark. 
PNC. Uh, to see Stan, the, the other time. thing, you know, Norwich, the minor leagues, uh, Norwich is off to a good start. Uh, the Connor, other minor Connor, league Norby, league, Norby, Nor Norby. Uh, yeah. uh, McDermott had a good, uh, he's had a, uh, a good outing. He still walked, he walked five guys in four and a third inning, but he's got great stuff. He throws strikes and doesn't walk guys. There's a good chance. He, he will see him before the year's over. All right. But, uh, Bowie, Aberdeen, Del Marva, they start Friday. The fifth, their opening uh, opening games uh, of the season for those guys. All right, I'm sure Luke will be at several Aberdeen Ironbird games. The, the uh, Ironbirds uh, roster just came out today, and it yeah. looks really good. It's uh, highlighted by Enrique Bradfield, uh, the first round pick from a year ago. So I'll uh, I'll get a lot of looks at him. Any any shot that Carter Baumler is he uh, is it? He looks like he's going to be in the rotation for Aberdeen. At Aberdeen, I'm really interested in seeing him pitch some night. All right. Uh, that does it for today. Again, we thank our friends at A.J. Michaels, uh, our friends at uh, at the new Atmans at Harbor Point and the old Atmans, of course, and the Costas Inn. That does it for today's show. For Luke Jackson, Ross Grimsley, I'm Stan the Fan. Enjoy your Orioles baseball. Don't forget, Orioles at 635 tonight and at 8, is it 7 o'clock, Luke, right? LSU versus Iowa the women's basketball in Albany, New York tonight. All right. That's going to be probably maybe Luke, would you agree? Maybe one of the largest audiences that have ever watched a women's basketball game. It will be the largest. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big one last year when uh, yeah. they played. All right. All right. That does it for today. Enjoy uh, your sports this weekend. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs>